President Liao, Professor Chang, esteemed colleagues, my first express my gratitude uh, for the invitation to give the Academia Silica lecture, annual lecture for 2019. I in fact first visited Academia Silica 15 years ago with my much esteemed and missed colleague, Professor Hu Jiayu from the National University. So in many ways, it feels like coming home to be here today. I've always, always felt that this was a unique center in the world for collaboration between ethnology and archeology. span And there is something unique about that because everywhere else, they're fragmenting, they're breaking apart. Here, it's still possible to see them in a unity. So today I want to ask you to help me rethink an old category, an old ethnological category, very old anthropological category, but which archaeologists always use in a certain way, and that is the concept of civilization. Civilization has for many years been a rejected concept in anthropology and sociology because of its past evolutionary and Eurocentric misuses. My reason for reintroducing the concept in this lecture is that it enables us to go beyond the narrow confines to which studies of culture and society are often confined. It allows us to analyze how societies and cultures relate to each other on a larger time frame and on a spatial scale. And in this lecture, I will show how we can do this without the assumption of either unilinear evolution and without Euro or any other ethnocentrisms. Of the many theories of civilization, I can point to two opposite tendencies that have dominated this field of study, and both of which I reject. The first tendency is found in Arnold J. Toynbee's 12 volume study, The Study of History the first volume with which was published in 1934, and the 12th and the last in 1961. It's a comparative study of the rise and fall of 22 different civilizations, each of which Toynbee saw as a manifestation of a particular cosmological vision of living in harmony. Toynbee rejected deterministic, particularly environmental cause-effect arguments. And his motive as a comparative historian was to use the concept of civilization as a preferable unit of comparison to the concept of nations. Nations, he argued, are never self-sufficient and, arbit and are arbitrary in their origin. The second tendency that has dominated the study of civilization can most famously be seen in British art historian Kenneth Clark's work on the subject which considered the rise of Western civilization to be securely superior to all others. Clark's 1969 television documentary series on the subject became famous because it was viewed and repeatedly broadcast in many other countries. Focusing entirely on the history of Western fine art, visual art and architecture, and its rise out of the so-called civil, less civilized art of the European Dark Ages, Clark knew the limitations to the scope of his analysis, but he insisted that his discernment of art could justify the term civilization and set a singular standard as a measure for all civilizations. This trope of admitting the possibility of other civilizations, but arguing that all should be evaluated against one measure, whether it is that of creativity or artistic and scientific achievements, or centralized rule or urbanization is clearly, I think, too limiting. Even more than Toynbee's, Clark's measure of a civilization is based on what the dominant minorities do and have achieved, omitting serious consideration of hierarchy and of its lower reaches being part and parcel of the same civilization. Given these, one may well ask, and given these biases and past misuses of the concept, why bother trying to recreate it? My answer would be the empirical one, that the concept of civilization has become even more salient in contemporary geopolitics, and therefore we are obliged to understand its analytic use even more so today. 
For me, the most promising, least Eurocentric conception of civilization in classical anthropology and, uh, and archaeology was the one forged by the sociologist Emil Durkheim and the ethnologist Marcel Mauss. Durkheim had a theory of social evolution that was singular, that is from mechanical to organic solidarity, and you might ex therefore expect that he would have a singular theory of the evolution of civilization. But surprisingly, he and his collaborator and nephew Marcel Mauss stressed the histories of civilizations in the plural and rejected connecting them to some hypothetical general evolution of humankind. Also important, he did not follow the assumption that urbanism, craft specialization, writing, literacy, trade, commodity specialization have to be the defining criteria. Durkheim, for example, categorized Australian Aborigines as a separate civilization based on their cosmological and moral unity. Durkheim and Mose were depending on a less than clear but still distinctly social phenomenon whose spatial extent was bigger or larger than the political society upon which their own theories of social order had been previously based. It was called Kulturkreislehren in Germany and subsequently exported to North America by the anthropologist Franz Boas became known as the study of culture areas. Tools, styles, language families, institutions of organizations such as kin chiefdoms, types of kinship, which could all be used to define the spread spatially over time of culture areas. And these sets of institutions, Durkheim and most argued, have no clear boundaries, no single social organism, yet they're linked to each other in an integrated symbolic but not functionally interdependent system. Such a system Durkheim and most described as a civilization, which can be constant across languages and political societies. Examples they initially listed included Christian civilization, Mediterranean civilization, Northwest America, but later most added societies of hunter-gatherers to his list of such as civilizations, such as the Australian Aborigines. And he envisaged four regions of what he speculated might be the huge civilizational spread through the coasts and islands of the South Pacific. Because civilizations are social phenomena, to Durkheim and most, they're moral milieus. They determine a certain cast of mind and of conduct, and conduct. Yet they travel and spread across social boundaries of all kinds over long courses of time. And in a later text, dated to the 1930s, Most, now writing on his own, defines so civilization as those social phenomena which are common to several societies, more or less related to each other by lasting contact through some permanent intermediaries or through relationships from common descent. A civilization is then, to Most, a family of societies. In the technical terms of Most and Durkheim's sociology, a civilization is a spread through such intermediaries of collective representations and practices, which are the social aspects of the materials of civilization. So to quote from Mos, civilization is a grand but not a totalizing concept of social, moral, cultural, and material life. It forces us to analyze mixtures, not just the ways in which cultures distinguish themselves from contiguous other cultures, but also the spread of cultures into each other and in combination with each other. And later he says again, the history of civilization from the point of view that concerns us is a history of the circulation between societies of the various goods and achievements of each. Societies live by borrowing from each other, but they define themselves rather by their refusal to recognize borrowing than by its acceptance. Moses' inspiration in thinking about civilization is clearly ethnological. It resists creating the division between ethnology and sociology that was necessary for the paradigm break that led in the 1920s to the foundation not just of cultural anthropology, but also of sociology and social anthropology. Instead, Moses frequently emphasizes that phenomena exist that are not limited to a specific society or culture. <clears throat> 
They are phenomena common to a larger or smaller group of societies and cultures. And these are phenomena, particularly material practices, that are what most called at one stage fit to travel. They overflow boundaries and do not themselves have fixed boundaries. An interesting parallel exists here in the work of the famous Chinese anthropologist Fei Xiaotong, who in the second edition of his book, Peasant Life in China, is influenced by Russian ethnologists and the introduction of ethnos theory from Russia to China. He was influenced in particular by the early work of Sergei Shirokogorov on the multi-ethnic composition of the Tongas, in which he emphasized that flows and interactions between ethnic groups in their formation should be studied rather than each group being studied in isolation. So, how do we recognize certain social aspects that may be used to characterize the totality of a civilization? My bias is to identify these aspects in terms of material culture and what most elsewhere also call techniques of the body. And at first, I'll refer to some earlier work I did with the archaeologist Dorian Fuller, the archaeobotanist Dorian Fuller, on food. In particular, techniques of cooking that can be used to identify persistent differences in comparative Eurasian civilizations. These differences in food and techniques of cooking indicate evidence of civilizational spreads and the maintenance of their borders over very long periods of time. I also believe these differences relate to persistent patterns of commensality that are linked to differences in ritual practice, in particular sacrifice, the construction of bodily substances and ritual. In particular, I and my colleague Dorian Fuller have explored ethnographic, ethnohistorical and archaeological evidence to indicate a recurrent contrast between East Asia and West Asia in terms of technologies of food and the ritual understanding of food. And I will go on to contrast in an association to be found in East Asia between sticky rice and ancestors that evolve food offerings and food being shared within familial groups, with an association to be found in Western Asia and North India that involves sacrifice to remote deities with the roasting and baking of food, constituting offerings by the devotees. Archaeological evidence of significant contrast in food preparation technologies suggests that these traditions can be traced back to the pre-Neolithic hunting and gathering societies with long established traditions of food preparation and related preferences in cultural taste. Roasting and baking, for example, are strongly linked to notions of sacrifice in which smoke feeds the gods. The roasting of meat and the baking of bread associated with West Eurasia and Northern South Asia correlate with cosmologies invoking distant gods or spirits for whose sacrifice is a means of propitiation. By contrast, in East Eurasia, techniques of boiling, elaborated into steaming, were long fundamental to cooking and linked with commensality and re regimes of feeding ancestors by living descendants. So in this slide here, I point out to the, the difference between boiling and the processing of food, how it softens, gelatinizes, starch releases, and grinding to make flour, which increases the digestible surface area, breaks cell walls, and releases more nutrients. And here, the big contrast I want to make between East Asia, boiling, steaming, whole grain cooking, and commensality with ancestors, and uh, north, from North India to Western Asia and parts of the Mediterranean uh, of oven, of the, in the Neolithic of ovens, flowers and breads, baking, roasting and sacrifice to distant gods. This difference or contrast involves, I would argue, cosmologies in which ancestral spirits and gods are meant to be attracted to reside close to living lineage and members. So the combination of technological traditions ingrained within cosmological frameworks 
may make for very powerful forces of technological and subsistence conservatism. In other words, I suggest there is a deep level of conservative taste that link basic ideas of feeding the body, the ingesting of food, to notions of ritual efficacy, of feeding the invisible, ancestors and gods, and to long-term patterns of culinary practices. To understand these conservative cultural traits, I would like to consider contrasts in the technology and techniques of food preparation, which have deep archaeological records. The archaeological presence of tools for intensive grinding can be considered against those for boiling and later steaming of foods. For example, on this map, you will see that the zones of pre-pottery agriculture, that is agriculture uh, that appears before pottery, which is associated particularly with the ancient Near East, and also with North America, South, Central America, and down into South America, contrasts with areas in the dark dotted lines with uh, boiling and steaming, and with also where you have pottery long before the domestication of crops and animals, that is, before the Neolithic domestication. Ceramics for boiling or steaming, and on the other hand, uh, querns and mills for grinding and for baking, are therefore essentially functional alternatives for making foods more edible, for the post-harvest intensification of foodstuffs. But these differing processes te te techniques will also produce foods that differ in texture and consistency, despite being made from similar raw organic materials. And we can expect, therefore, that the symbolism of food substance may inform and be informed by choices made in processing. In other words, what constitutes properly cooked food, as opposed to the raw, may be defined differently in different traditions which will involve different processing techniques. And this raises the question as to the, under what circumstances cultural groups may have preferred one to the other, or whether this choice was predetermined by culturally inherited matters of taste or ritual understanding in which food was embedded. Now, perhaps choice is a wrong word here, because if taste is embedded in technique, we can show that in some regions, pottery making techniques did develop earlier amongst hunter-gatherer fishers for whom agriculture only developed millennia later. And this was the case in the tropical lowlands of South America, as you can see on this map, where pottery began in some forager fisher local traditions about four to 5,000 BC. Pottery also preceded agriculture in parts of East Asia, including Japan, the Russian Far East, and South China, where radiocarbon dating has shown that ceramic vessels were produced since the late Pleistocene, at least 15,000 before the present, and perhaps as early as 18,000 years ago. Early pottery of the Sahara is associated with boiling foods, which precede domestic plants and animals in many regions in North Africa. And although the practice may have initially developed in the Eastern Sahara in the context of hunter-gatherer or hunter cattle herders gathering wild grasses. But the Near East is especially well researched here. Here the exploitation of wild cereals and evidence for the preparation of flour with grinding stones dates back to about 23,000 before the present. You know, at the archaeological site of Ohalo II, in the Sea of Galilee, dated to about 23,000 BP, and where uh, you also have plant remains that indicate the use of wild emma, wild barley, and small seeded grasses in order to make baked bread uh, for uh, food, but presumably other purposes as well. So these approaches to food are more than just technologies for nutrition they have become embedded in long-term cultural traditions of what food is. 
and as new foods and technologies have become available, they've been adjusted for and added to these existing traditions in ways that add elaboration and choice to the existing systems without fundamentally changing them. I would also suggest that the boiling traditions of East Asia provide the basis for regional cultural differences for sticky or glutinous cereals. The most widespread glutinous cereal is rice, and genetic data indicates a single widespread allele shared by all sticky rice, implying a single origin of this trait, perhaps in mainland Southeast Asia. Once it has occurred as a mutation within different types of early cultivated japonica rice, these varieties must have been favorably propagated and spread widely within the rice growing regions of East and Southeast Asia. So this just to show the development of boiling ceramics during the Neolithic, proceeding out of the Paleolithic where you have ceramics before domesticated cereals and then the development of ceramics through the Neolithic with domesticated, particularly rice, and in northern China with millets. Oh, to the distribution during this period of glutinous rice, or rice with an allele which makes it sticky, so either sticky rice in terms of the larger dotted outline, and then within the dotted outline of sticky rice, you have zones for sticky millet and also other um, sticky millets, and then also barley and sorghum varieties, which starts to get, bring the whole issue that as new cereals come into this bounded area of East Asia to Southeast Asia, it turns from one form genetically into its glutinous form. Foods, therefore, were adapted in various ways and used. Thus, when meat with wheat was introduced to China, it was adapted to make rather soft and sticky noodles or steamed dumplings. As noted by Marco Polo, such wheat as was produced, he says, they ate only in the form of noodles or other pasty foods. And the recent discovery of traces of Neolithic noodles at an archaeological site in China, although associated with millet phytolis, indicate earlier boiled flour foods, a tradition that eventually allowed the incorporation of wheat more widely into the Chinese diet. Historical and archaeological sources suggest that wheat only became a widespread staple in central China from around the Han Dynasty, when rotary querns made it easier to transform these grains into flour that could in turn be molded into noodles for boiling or for buns for steaming. In other words, grinding re-emerged in importance in China after the adoption of Western cereals, wheat and barley, as a means of turning them into a powder that could be readily boiled to produce a sticky food product, similar to the whole grain millet and rice that Neolithic Chinese were accustomed to eating. The cohesiveness of these foods, especially rice and sticky millets, plays a significant symbolic role in relationships with ancestors and gods and an East Asian style of sacrifice and cosmology. Food is intrinsic to most Chinese ritual activity and food offerings have been an intrinsic part of Chinese death rituals for at least seven millennia. Food plays a crucial role in relating physical discontinuity with social continuity of turning a dead corpse into an ancestor. Ritual also involves exchanges between the living and the dead on a more or less reciprocal basis. Feeding the ancestors depends, uh, depended on food prestations from their living descendants, which gives leverage to the latter. But if this duty is neglected, then the anger of ancestors has severe consequences for the living. Ancestor worship 
was an extension of filial piety. But proper reciprocity also brings a good life to the living. Wealth, secure harvest, offspring. Unlike the classic alliance building feasts of the ancient Near East, feasts with ancestors in China were family affairs, partaken in or witnessed only by descendants and close kin. And Nelson refers to this as feasting to create an ancestor. The aim is to attract and keep ancestral spirits close. The veneration of ancestors is continuous with a broader pattern of proper conduct in Chinese civilization. Chinese civilization is a hierarchy of statuses, not of status groups, of relations among equals, principally those of patrilineal descent, analogically extended to ruler and subject, and from siblings to trusted associates in their networks. It is a hierarchy that stimulates aspiration to acquire the social arts, including the conduct of ritual and interpersonal conduct, as well as other arts of self-cultivation. And unlike the West Eurasian tradition of roasting sacrifice, clear distinctions are made in China between food for ancestors and food for gods or other animistic forces, with ancestors normally being emphasized. And as emphasized by Lu and Nelson, feasting for ancestors can be traced through archaeological grave finds in central China from the Neolithic through to the Bronze Age with evolving ritual sets of vessels, but always a focus on grain, wines, and foods. We can hypothesize that the importance of ancestral veneration and acts of food consumption that helped to maintain ancestral substances persisted throughout Chinese history. And this is suggested by the distinction made between ancestors and deities. In some regions, ancestors are worshipped through tablets in halls, separate from temples to gods. Or if under the same roof, ancestral tablets are kept separate from the images of gods. In communal shrines, food for ancestors will be to the left of the altar, food for gods to the right. And we can hypothesize, therefore, that hierarchy based on ancestral cults both to family and to lineage altars, predate and become subsumed by later Buddhist and Taoist hierarchies. Just to summarize, therefore, the sense of the separation and distinction of different uh, spreads of food and food commensalities and diets, and how if you impose on that the milking frontier that Frederick Siemens suggested earlier in 1970, you can see that the boundary through roughly, roughly the boundary through Tibet, Tibet to Assam and uh, up into uh, Central Asia, you know, is something that is constantly being reinforced by various new additions, you know, sort of over time. So the link between ritual and sticky rice or ritual sharing as in this Burmese court scene, is also emphasized by the bringing together, as this uh, slide I took with uh, uh, Jayu Hu uh, in 2004 uh, in her uh, area of research, field research in Taiwan, where the bringing together of sticky rice and pounding it together from different families, pounding it together, and then sharing it out to feed and eat was very obviously emphasized. <coughs> if we now turn to a Western Eurasian long-term tradition, offerings of bread have long had a symbolic role in West Eurasia, including the Near East, North Africa, and the Mediterranean, where this map of the distribution of bread ovens dating from between the 7th and the 44th millennium uh, before contemporary era, you know, sort of shows. This is clear from the centrality of breads, leavened or unleavened, in the world religions that emerged in these regions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The anthropologist Victor Turner has drawn our attention to the linkage of bread, flour, and sacrifice the word immolation in English, for example, derives from the Latin to sprinkle, to sprinkle with sacred power. 
As bread and roasting go together in food preparation, they also often co-occur in ritual food. As baking requires heat and often ovens rather than cooking containers, so does roasting, in which meats are cooked largely in their own juices. The very nature of roasting in which smoke rises from the cooking of meat provides a potent index to the relationship with the invisible. Traditions like those of Sumer, Judaism, or ancient Greece involved roasting sacrificial meats in which the smoke rises towards distant gods or spirits that must be propitiated. Such deities are very distant, but nevertheless interventionist in human affairs, like the distant and vengeful Hebrew Yahweh. Sacrifice as in these examples, Indo-European fire rituals, Near Eastern sacrificial traditions of animal sacrifice, or the Passover rituals in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. Such sacrifice is as much about propitiation, keeping a distant God favorable, as it is about getting what one wants. The argument is made by the ancient historian, Jean-Pierre Vernon, Vernon, writing on ancient Greece sac Greek sacrifice, where he says, the ritual sets the incorruptible bones aside for the gods and sends them consumed by the flames on high in the form of fragrant smoke and gives men the meat of an already lifeless animal, a piece of dead flesh, so that they may satisfy for a moment their constantly awakening hunger. Similar patterns can be identified in other early Near Eastern ritual practice. For example, in New Kingdom Egypt, temple reliefs indicate that religious practices involved roasting meat for a god. So this ancient Egyptian tomb figure showing making bread in, a, in an afterlife domestic scene. And in the top register, the the, the Pharaoh Amenhotep III is fanning smoke from a sacrifice so that the smoke will rise to feed a god. The relief and sculptures here accompany texts of spells that were used to protect the roasting spit and the fan. And after the offerings had been made, the food was shared out to the community through the hierarchy of temple and royal servants. Thus, a redistribution of sacrificial food at a trans-community level, rather than as a kinship group, provide a basis for common cell politics after the gods were appeased. The reproduction of the social system extended, therefore, to the maintenance of the invisible, supernatural world. But this was a world in which gods and ancestors were distant. In my comparison of East and West Eurasia, I followed the principle of identifying civilizations by detecting the presence of clear suprasocial entities that can be shown to endure from the beginning of the Holocene to the present day, obviously with transformations. Whilst we can accept transformations and adaptations within these long-term continuities of cultural form, it is the detection of stable, if not expanding, culture areas that suggest patterns of food and hospitality have wider civilizational significance. And perhaps we can just summarize some of these by looking at how these forms cosmological technologies. So the materialities of cooking can be linked to metallurgy. It's striking, for example, that molten iron is the first developed in China by the eighth century uh, before BCE, and we find that uh, the whole question of clay moulds and later uh, and the casting of clay moulds is a still a sophisticated technology we little understand. Whereas you compare it to Western technology and the whole focus on ovens and furnaces and smelting, and it's linked to smelting and metallurgy, is a technological exaptation on baking traditions. Ores are ground, they're roasted or they're baked blooms are formed. In fact, cast iron only occurs really in the 18th century in Europe. You work metals by hammering and raising rather than casting. So I think we can extend the whole cosmology of this difference into a wider range about cultural technology 
and cosmological uh, influences on technology. So far, I've been concerned with showing the existence of civilizations as distinct cosmologies in a long-term perspective. However, in his perspective on civilization, Marcel Mauss stressed the need to retain diffusionist ideas of cultural spread and innovation. He argued that this forces us to analyze mixtures, but not in the ways that cultural diffusionists had distinguished centers of superior innovation to dependent peripheries. Instead, he emphasized the spread of civilizations, how they encountered each other and copied each other. Now, if we focus on connections and encounters between civilizations rather than their absolute differences, a good starting point is the trading connections between Africa and South Asia that were established by the end of the third millennium BC in the Northwest Indian Ocean area. Here, there was an integration of hitherto separate trading systems of the Persian Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea Gulf uh, of Aden area into uh, what becomes a more significant area of integration. And again, one looks at crops and food here as a, as a sign, as a trace, as a way of looking at much more complex, wider networks. But you need something to actually show what direction they're going and often the spread of domesticated plants and animals and crops is a good way of looking at it. So crops move through networks outside the old trading sphere. That is, out in here, this whole area from the Horn of Africa across to Western India, in the, uh, in the, in the, in, in connecting to the, uh, the Red Sea and the Gulf, are outside the kind of classic civilizational areas of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and those areas to the north. And this seems to be very significant in this period between 5,000 and 4,000 before present. Fuller and Boivin have shown that trade in obsidian and almost certainly incense and other exotics, such as myrrh and frankincense, were also exchanged across this region, separate from Bronze Age development. They document much earlier than previously thought the spread of major crops. particularly from Africa to the drier regions of central e India via the same coastal trading routes of the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. So again, one of the first domesticated millets, pearl millet, domesticated in West Africa, in the Sahel zone of West Africa, spreads across to, to the North Horn of Africa uh, to the Red Sea, and finally spreads to India by 1900, 1700 BC, spread through the savannah to the forest edges of western central Africa, and finally through the Bantu expansion by 500 BC throughout the rest of south, southern Africa. And when you look at a more complex map of these spreads, including pearl millet, sorghum, and teff, and other domesticates from Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and their appearance by the beginning of the second millennium in central India. Again, it's the integration of the Indian Ocean south of any connection with the so-called Bronze Age civilizations of uh, Mesopotamia and uh, Anatolia, and also talking about uh, any connections with ancient Egypt. So millets originating as domesticates in the Sahel region of West Africa are transmitted west to east along the Sahelian corridors by the beginning of the third millennium BCE. And through culture and multiple exchanges between West Africa and India into the early second millennium BC. And in this case, it's clear that the aim of trade and the movement of people, boats and goods was not to provide access to domesticated millets as subsistence food items, in fact, domesticated plants spread because they were being taken on board boats as food for the crew and were then opportunistically taken up as cultivable crops in different locations that the boat traveled to. The basis for trade itself was the distribution of ritual substances and the creation of an Arabian Sea corridor between Africa and India was very likely stimulated by the demand for incense 
particularly black pepper, camphor, and frankincense and myrrh. And this was a precursor of the later route for the medieval spice trade. The first evidence of the spread of black peppercorns, which at this time grew only in the wet forests of southern India, comes not from its use in food, but to fragrance the nostrils of the mummified body of the deceased Pharaoh Ramesses II, dating to about 1200 BC. The process of mummification of ancient Egyptian pharaohs depended crucially on gaining access to frankincense from the land of Punt, present-day Somalia, and black pepper from southern India. And by the end of the third millennium BC, links between Africa, the Persian Gulf, and India were limited to the Arabian Sea. But in the next millennia, systematic links were made across the Indian Ocean. And in the period leading into the first millennium BC, Southeast Asian cultivars were brought to India and to the most moist tropical zones of Central and West Africa. And we hear the, see the beginnings of that trio of banana, plantain, taro, and large clump yam complex appearing in Central Africa. So this spread of the, grand, of the great trio of yam, taro, and plantain banana, which probably has something to do with the Bantu expansion into Southern Africa, connects with these kind of in, in, uh, exchanges and, encount and, and, and flows from, uh, domestic, from the first domesticates of plantain banana, as we know, in Highland New Guinea, and these other domesticates and their, their flows to Southeast Asia and finally to the east coast of India. Now, from a world system perspective, food and traces as evidence for interactions and trade routes between Africa, the Gulf region, and India will be seen as either periphery or semi-periphery, you know, to the urban centers of Mesopotamia and Egypt. But this would be the wrong perspective. There's increasing evidence of the independence of these networks. Their origin requires there to have been no prior involvement in trade with the urban Bronze Age centers of southern Mesopotamia, or those of ancient Egypt or the Mediterranean. And this transfer took place primarily between northeast Africa, Yemen, and western India, probably outside of the context, as I said, of the Bronze Age trade between major civilizations. So why should contacts between small-scale agro-pastoral societies in the African Sahel, fishing and seafaring communities on the Arabian Sea coast, and hunter-gatherer communities on the West Indian coast be motivated by the transport of what? It seems to be highly valued ritual and exotic substances. We have from an early date a separate Africa, Indian Ocean, and eventually Southeastern Asian corridor of interactions and flows of people with ritual substances and objects of a ritual nature. And this corridor also brought Southeast Asian products, as I said, plantains, bananas, and taro to South India and East Africa, helping to create a, a sustainable world of subsistence. So what is the difference about these zones in the South so-called, so independent from the development of urban civilizations in the north, that in terms of flows and connectivity by the mid-first millennium BCE, they show common linkages in transfers of food items, spices, and ritual substance. What is so different about their avoiding these Bronze Age urban commodity trade networks? In other words, they somehow remain stuck in the Neolithic. And what drives the movement of people and things in the absence of a clear mercantile abstract logic of profit-oriented trade? One clue must lie in the nature of the demand for these ritual substances. Myrrh, frankincense, camphor, later glass beads and many other things. Not in their communities of origin necessarily, the demand isn't necessarily there, but precisely in the urban Bronze Age and later civilizations that were the major consumers of them, but which this regions of the South avoided. Let me cite an example of the need to consume exotics from the South. In 847, the new emperor of China, Xuantung, issues a decree which, among other decrees, required that he took out memorials and petitions from his vassals only after he'd washed his hands and burned incense. 
at the great levee, when the archaic robes and ceremonial mats were laid out in the basilica, the table of aromatics was placed before the Son of Heaven. The great councillors of state then stood before this table and, perfused with the magical fragrance, proceeded to conduct the business of state. This quote from Edward Schaeffer's book, The Golden Peaches of Samarkand, is remarkable for the emphasis placed on the materiality of statecraft. Aromatics, incense and perfumes were indispensable to the carrying out not just of state rituals, but the everyday business of purifying places of governance and the bodies of those who held power. Pleasant odours also entered into secular life, especially the social life of the gentry. Another quote from Schaeffer. We read of a luxurious prince of the 8th century who could not speak to his guests until, unless he had aloes wood and musk in his mouth which he chewed and then spread or sprayed his saliva over them. All Bronze Age urban civilizations depended for their reproduction on ritual substances and the ritual purification of power. From the perspective of the temple economies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, the south, meaning broadly Yemen, Oman and the Somali coast, was a source of incense as part of sacrificial offerings to deities in temple rituals. The burning of incense originated from the much earlier Neolithic sacrificial roasting and baking traditions of Western Eurasia, stretching from the Indus to the Mediterranean. And in their discussion of ancient Greek sacrifice, Vernel and Detian emphasized the role of pouring incense and oils on roasted meat to produce the odors and smoke that would attract and seduce the attention of transcendent deities. Offerings of myrrh and frankincense and possibly obsidian for hair removal were critical components of ancient Egyptian funeral rituals, both for the preservation of the dead and the transmission of the spirit of the dead to an afterlife. So the use of aromatics and incense is a widespread feature of Bronze Age rituals throughout Eurasia. Dependence on their use in state rituals meant that relying on access to the unguents, spices and oils from the south, was more than a luxury or an exotica nor could these substances be easily substituted with alternatives from regions that were more controllable through commerce and violence. In other words, whilst a good case has been made recently for the embedding of commodity trade as part of the temple economies of Eurasia, it is the exclusion of the zone from Africa, the Indian Ocean and its connections with southern India to Ireland, Southeast Asia, from the profit-making logic of these Bronze Age trade works, networks that should be emphasized. And the absence of seals, common weight systems, standard measures throughout the trade zone also suggests that the value attributed to these southern substances was not a matter of quantitative assessment or the integrity of the contents of trade, uh, uh, trade uh, packages. What I like about the approach of Durkheim and Moss is precisely their focus on the supranational and the superstate idea of a civilizational spread the shared culture that extended from Africa across the Indian Ocean by the end of the first millennium's contemporary era was part of a literate tradition that was not controlled by a single theocratic priest or ruler, but involved Buddhist and Jain monks, traders, craftsmen and scholars, all travelling together. Kanheri on the west coast of India, on this map, as you see up on the west coast of uh, India, was one of the largest of these early Buddhist monastic complexes. It included 104 caves located in the fertile basin of the Ulhaus River and has been dated from the 1st to the 11th century's contemporary era. Merchants and traders were the major patrons of such Buddhist monastic sites. So what was the connection between Buddhist caves and shrines and merchants and sea seafarers? We've seen that fishing and sailing routes were the crucial component of sea travel along the West Indian coast up to the Persian Gulf from the second millennium before contemporary era and almost certainly early, earlier than this, bringing black pepper, camphor, frankincense and myrrh to ritually reproduce the sacred kingships and temple economies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. But by the early first millennium of the contemporary era, these sailing and shipbuilding coastal communities 
if Indian were prominently linked to Buddhism, were quite distinct from merchants and traders, who on occasion might own a ship, but nev never sailed it as a seafarer. Boat here steered by an Indian crew with Muslim merchants as passengers on a maritime trade route. You know, from a temple, from actually a temple site in, in Chengzhou. Maritime communities on the coast of West India and the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea were of many different ethnic origins. They included Arabs, Nabataeans, Sabaeans, in addition to Indians who traded in wood, textiles, and sp spices as a mainstay of the Indian Ocean trade. And shared among merchants and seafarers is their devotion to temples and the development of a complex religious landscape in the large area of Western India up to the Red Sea. For a comprehensive appraisal of crafts and communities in this area, the intertwined strands of religious architecture, economic activity and political event intervention need to be examined and understood. And one of these strands is certainly the association of Buddhism with the protection of ships and seafarers. Buddhist rituals differed from Hinduism and Jainism in the emphasis placed on the protection against the dangers of, and perils of the sea. Indian merchants and seafarers seem to have particularly favoured the spread of Buddhism to the Red Sea and beyond. They connected protective rituals against dangers of the sea with the building of temples that also functioned as ports of trade. Traders, sailors and artisan guilds were to a large extent dedicated adherents of Buddhism and significant donors of religion and sacred centres. From the late 1st century BCE to the 4th or 1st century of the contemporary era, bodies, Buddhism was expanding and missionaries were sent to try to convert people to this religion. Indian influence can be seen in the case of Meroe, the Kushite temp kingdom in Nubia, in the Horn of Africa, that had been dominated by ancient Egypt under the Ptolemies because local deities were depicted in Indian styles of kingship. For example, the inscription of riding elephants as a sign of a ruler. But if we switch our gaze eastward to Southeast Asia, we see a familiar story there of the spread of Buddhism along sea routes. Indian traders resided in coastal towns and ports of trade in which religious centers and temples had been established that were directly related to sea trade and the protection of ships and men at sea. As a historian of Buddhism, Buddhist cults, Himanshu Ray explains, Buddhism was unusual in developing rituals that unlike its contemporary world religions were devoted to the welfare of ships and sailors. The earliest representation of this is on a second century uh, uh, before contemporary area medallion from the Bahut Stupa in Uttar Pradesh in East India, which shows a gigantic sea creature swallowing a boat. On the basis of the inscription, the merchant has been identified as Vosugupta, who saved himself from disaster by meditation on the Buddha. Another early example of this theme can be found in a 6th century Tamil text the only Buddhist text written in Tamil, where a deity is described as a goddess of the sea and patron of uh, sea traders. And a related development was the cult of the Bodhisattva and Velakrasavara as a saviour of mariners and travellers in distress. And this has usually been associated with the spread of Mayana Buddhism through an enumeration of the dangers of tra travel, which is also, of course, the branch of Buddhism that reached maritime southern China by some time in the early to mid fourth uh, millennium of the contemporary era. At this point, let me remind you of an earlier quote I referenced from Marcel Mauss. He said, the history of civilization from the point of view that concerns us is the history of the circulation between societies of the various goods and achievements of each. Societies live by borrowing from each other but they define themselves rather by their refusal to recognize borrowing than by its acceptance. A problem with the narrative I've produced so far is it describes endless chains of borrowings and circulations that create rather homogenous flows and connections 
over an area of world from coastal North and East Africa to South Asia and finally to Southeast China. But this is not what actually appears on the ground. Instead, cultural boundaries are created, rather like those between food and subsistence patterns I describe for West and East Asia. The boundaries are civilizational and yet do not necessarily correspond to any contemporary national or geopolitical distinctions. Instead, they correspond with long-term continuities in language and material culture that act to absorb innovations and creativities from the outside and turn them into localized values. And if we take a simple map of the spread of Buddhist cults along the maritime routes from South Asia to East Asia, the use of solid lines on this map obscures the reality of the adaption of the adaptation of Buddhist expansion to local cults found more or less at all points along the line, along the way. Recent work by the historian Janet Sargat has emphasized that the creation of Buddhist shrines in Southeast Asia followed and adapted to local animist cults. They were not simply copies of shrines found in South Asia. She describes them as syncretic or mixes of Buddhist, Brahmanical and local animistic cults on the eastern and western coasts of Malaysia. I think a similar argument could be made to the similar spreads towards and into Southeast China and perhaps Taiwan, where there's also evidence of syncretic fusion of local and Buddhist interaction. And here, just let me refer quickly to one, that is the association with the famous uh, origins of Matsu from uh, a slide that uh, Professor Chang kindly gave me uh, from the Kuan Yin Palace. According to the folklore, the parent of Matsu prayed to Kuan Yin, Kuan Yin Buddhas for a child so as to have Matsu born. And Matsu's spirit uh, of Mary and mercy and assistance came down in kind of continuous uh, lines uh, once generation. So the Matsu temple before the Qing dynasty always had Kuan palace, a main side palace, and had kind of place in it. And I think there's a, there's a very interesting, uh, often this kind of li link between uh, Buddhism on the west and a, a local deity on the east is a, is a not more interesting pattern here. And uh, another possible sign of this, uh, of this uh, fusion, um, recently I was in Chenzhou and uh, I went to the temple for uh, what is called King Tongluan or Tongluan Wang, which is one of the earliest uh, sea gods in the southeast China coast. It's one of six sea gods before Matsu, dating to certainly the Tang, if not earlier, dynasty, if not earlier. And uh, Tanglun is uh, seen as a mountain god who then transforms to a river god and then to a sea god uh, by the, by the uh, beginning of the, of the Northern Song dynasty. So that the uh, mountain god becomes a sea god as the influence of maritime, uh, of maritime trade you know, sort of affects. Two inscriptions on the entrance pillars of the uh, temple to Tonglong Wang, which is still exist today in uh, northern Chenzhou, record the visits of imperial officials of the Southern Song to pray for wind, and in the museum are tomb bricks with figures of Buddhist monks, which uh, the archaeologists I asked about who uh, excavated them uh, assures me that he, can think, he thinks he can date these to the third or fourth century of the contemporary era. We have to get more evidence for that. Okay, in conclusion, I have offered a conception of civilization that describes all human cultures, but sets them in larger contexts of similarity and differentiation and variation, but sets them also in terms of longer durations of persistence and transformations. My minimal definition of, self of a civilization is some kind of self-fashioning by restraint, but with reference to an encompassing sense of the world that also defines what is human and what humans do.
But in the course of my exposition, I've been struck by three further circumstances or concomitants of civilization. First, the importance of often quite mundane material flows and exchanges and the way in which they can be used as evidence. Second, the problematization of religion and ritual, the link between, for example, here, archaeology and religious anthropology. And third, how anthropological histories interact with self-identifying histories of civilizations in the present day. And just let me conclude in a couple of minutes with a few remarks on the last of these about the present day. Accompanying a deep crisis in the legitimacy of many basic 20th century concepts of nation and state, and a growing erosion of the long-term dominance of international agencies, such as the UN, the IMF, and the World Bank, is the re-emergence, I believe, of a belief in the presence of long-term continu continuities of larger-scale civilizations. Such rediscoveries of deep pasts in terms of long-standing political and cosmological duration is a repressed category that is being revived and rediscovered in different contexts that require comparison and conceptual revival. I've made a first attempt to do this, taking advantage of new and in particular archaeological sources of data on long-term flows and interactions, on scales that would not normally be considered possible. But a concept of civilization has also enabled us to ask how our histories bear on current heritage claims. They are self-validating and selective, as of course any civilization is. But are these heritage claims a transformation, even a destruction of the civilizations they claim? Inevitably, when we refer to spreads of cultural variation and differentiation, in broad regions, we're already dealing with claims to regional heritage in the present day, be they of Asian values in East Asia, or a mix of Platonic and Christian and Celtic values defining something called European heritage, or a Pan-African identity. Yet it's these impulses of modern cultural heritage that have driven historical and archaeological discoveries upon which we rely for evidence. So in the spirit of this lecture, I've elaborated with extended illustrations a conception of civilization that can be self-critical and questioning. In demonstrating long durations of continuity and of transformation, if not disruption, my aim has been to provide material for more guarded, less simple, but nevertheless valid claims of regional heritages, which are also civilizations. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.